so today, basically, what I'm going to do is try to convey how we get the biology out of this long list of genes that we've just produced. And this is pretty common. I mean, you know, you'll analyze a sample. I mean, we're able to survey all genes now, right? And that you'll get potentially get back a list of a thousand genes. What do you do with that? Do you just take the top target? No. That these genes that we generate that say these 747 genes that we know are important in um, aggressive lymphomas, they have connections, right? That no gene works in isolation. One gene leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to another. That there is a biological connection to this list we just made. That they are working together somehow to perform this function. In this case, it's to be a more aggressive lymphoma, okay? So what I'm going to try to teach you today, you know, I can't teach you what I do in an hour and a half. I just can't. Or I can't make you experts in even just one of these bioinformatics software programs. What I hope to convey today is, so what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce you to two of the most popular bioinformatics programs out there. David and Ingenuity Pathway Analysis. So David is a freeware solution. Ingenuity Pathway Analysis is a commercial product. Has anyone used either of those two? Which one have you used? Uh, IPA. IPA? Sweet. How about you? Same. IPA. So again, David is free. We're going to analyze this gene list using David. Um, you know, you kind of get what you pay for. So at some point during the analysis, we've been doing this the whole week, there's an internet cop on David. And so we're pinging, you know, their server from one location. So eventually they're going to shut some of us down. <laughs> I just, I'm just going to warn you right now. So when that does happen, you know, don't worry about it. Don't panic. Just, just follow what I'm doing. You know, you can obviously do this on your own. I've got videos for it. You can go back and forward, which makes it really nice. And that's kind of why I picked up uh, putting my videos on YouTube. It's just a great way to learn. I think my 12-year-old learned, I don't know, complicated computers just doing that. I'm like, how did you do that? She's like, there's a YouTube, Dad. That's great. <laughs> this is a perfect way to teach. Okay, so we're going to do David. Basically, I'm going to kind of run through some of the things David offers you. You know, there's some really cool things on David. And then we'll do IPA, which is a commercial software. And I'm just going to say right now that, you know, for most institutions, if you were going to share a license, which most institutions have, it's going to be about $2,000 a year. If you want to get your own standalone license, it's about 10000 A lot of institutions, especially ones that are named after people, Dana-Farber, uh, you know, Sloan Kettering, you're going to have, if you check with your institution, you probably have a free use for IPA. That your institution has got IPA and you can somehow use it. If not, they also have, um, you can basically trial periods for IPA. And if you have a lot of computers in your lab, you can get very creative with this. <laughs> I didn't just say that. I'm going to have to cut that out of the movie. Okay. So let's get started. Let's go find some biology in this list. All right. Well, first off, what I want to explain to you is that the skills that are, you know, the things I'm going to talk about today, you can not only apply to your data, but more importantly, you can apply to all the data out there. So open up your uh, browsers. And you should have had bookmarked Gene Expression Omnibus somewhere on your bookmark. Everybody on that window? Gene Expression Omnibus. It should be in your favorites. Go to favorites, or you can just type it in. Is everybody there? OK, see this keyword accession number over here, the search? Type in your, whatever cancer you are working on, type that in. I work on lung cancer, among many, many different types of cancers. But this is my major one. Hit the search key. When I do this, this top line basically says there are 33, about 33,000 data sets in this database that have lung cancer as a keyword. How many did everybody else get? Hopefully no one got zero. Did anybody get zero? Anybody beat 33,000? What's the next highest? 
<laughs> she got four million. Yeah. What I'm trying to demonstrate to you is that you might, you might, this is what happens to me a lot when I do bioinformatics, is that somebody will come to me and say, Mike, I want to apply for this grant. Here's my proposed project. You know, I'm going to correlate gene expression to lung cancer stage. And I've got like 10 samples. And I'll ask them, I'll say, well, did you actually look in the database to see if anybody else has done that? Is there, if there are any other data sets? <laughs> no. <laughs> so I'll actually look and I'll find not only, well, I find exactly what they're trying to do, but it'll be actually more samples and a, a better constructed study. It's like, why would you ever do that? You know, you could do this beforehand. Using other people's data, using, you know, basically utilizing all this information that's out there can save you years in research. It really can. You know, it's like getting a heads up of what's going on. It's like getting the cliff notes of whatever you're doing. You know, trust me, you know, you can, you can mark my words that most biologists, most bench scientists are going to have to be bioinformaticians at some point. That you can't ignore all of this data, right? This is just a fraction of the data that's out there. And if we look down here, GEO contains 1.5 million samples in it right now. This number is only increasing, right? So what I'm going to hopefully do for you today is, you know, we have all this data. How do we utilize it to actually get biological meaning in whatever we're looking at? So this data is the raw data from their experiments, right? Like they get data yes. Entire... You can get the raw data and you can also get the process data. A lot of these bioinformatics programs, not like SeekMonk, but some of the commercial products, you just have to put in the accession number and the program will actually get the data for you. And I do that stuff all the time. So if you want to use the data for a different analysis than what the people did in the paper, do you have to get permission? Or no. <laughs> I want to stress this. This is free. You can grab people's data. You can publish on it. You can throw it up in the air and eat it, whatever you want to do with it. It is free. And not a lot of people utilize that. There's this, there's this concept in you know, biology that you, know, you have to generate your own data. But we're kind of moving away from that. You know, it's kind of flipping. It's like, how do you utilize that information to do something? Usually, you know, right now, the, the biologists I work with kind of use me as a tool to figure out what they want to do on their favorite gene. But that's going to flip. So bioinformaticians are going to say, hey, you know, I've looked at lung cancer. I think this pathway is important. Where's my experts that do that bench work? So, and I also want to say, believe me or not, I teach this to high school kids. I do. And not some rich, you know, uh, country club high school either. You know, this is kind of a, a low income community. And these kids get it. The more you understand by technology, the more you're comfortable with it, you're going to get this. And you're definitely going to get this more than your bosses. I guarantee it. All right. So let's do this. Just on a side note, uh, most journals now, if you've done any type of um, large-scale data collection, requires you to have an accession here or somewhere else that the data is publicly and freely available. Right. So if you have a cool paper that you've read and you go, oh, wow, that sounds like a, some uh, interesting uh, samples and I might want to look at it, There'll be a reference there where they've deposited somewhere and you can go get that data yourselves. Okay. So, yeah. So, what is the standardization in terms of getting data into here? Because there's old class two color arrays that you want with modern. Yeah, so all that's uh, handled in GEO. You have to, the depositor has to do sort of a lot of upfront work, but everything with an experiment ID that information through the website. So if you did have a custom array, I was talking to someone the other day, we found a good data set, but it's old, so it's a two-color array. So you have to download the platform information, which is here, and the data. And start here that look at. You can also, with a lot of these, they have the, what is it called, GEO2R? Yeah, so GEO2R is a very simple-minded tool that you could go to an experiment find the groups and just get a So you can generate your gene, gene list on GEO itself. And I do that a lot, actually. When I work with the students, we'll just generate our, our gene list from GEO itself. 
and then we'll use this software to kind of figure out what's going on. All right, let's go to, so I want you to go to IPA. Let's open our IPA window. This one takes a while, so I want to download our gene list. Okay. So the deal with IPA, what makes IPA so special is that it's a human curated database. All right. Most of the freeware bioinformatics software use is just simply text mining. That all these genes that we are looking at have text associated with them. You know, a coherent domain. Um, this is associated with NF kappa B signaling. Lots and lots of texts are associated with all these genes. And basically what these freeware solutions do is it uses an algorithm to kind of cluster genes or group genes based on similar terms. Ingenuity, on the other hand, actually it's a human curated database. That the legend has it, there, there's some island off of you know, San Francisco in the Pacific where they have a bunch of postdocs chained to the computers. <laughs> Just going through PubMed and... and basically collecting all the, this information. Okay, this gene interacts with this gene, which interacts with this gene. I would say IPA right now is probably the most powerful bioinformatics software on the planet, okay? But I, I am gonna teach you with the David as well. All right. Yours is up, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so go to the new button and hit new core analysis. So this is where we're going to upload our gene list. Okay, we have saved the gene list to your computer. So on this upload a new data set, hit upload. Now go to your desktop and your original folder, AACR folder. Mine's a little different. I've been uh, collecting gene lists from all you guys, which is fascinating. Actually, I've, I've enjoyed like the gene list that I've got from, from you uh, participants. It's like I'm learning all kinds of stuff about cancer. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to select this first list, ABC versus GCB, SIG, gene list, N74A. Double-click on that. Oops. And you can close this data upload workflow. This is big, and this is a nice feature of IPA, is that you can actually follow this workflow and, and, and download your data. This software, unlike a lot of freeware solutions, is very user-friendly. And that's what I've found is that if a freeware solution is user-friendly, it usually doesn't do much. If it does a lot, it's usually not user-friendly. Has anybody used Galaxy before? The one he was just talking about? I hate Galaxy. <laughs> but it does a lot of cool stuff. All right, so here's what we gotta do. So here's our gene list. These are the 748 genes. Right now, it's not recognizing anything this data summary table. We got to tell the software what it is. So I'm going to go to this first column where we have our IDs in, and I'm going to hit ID. Now your data summary should say 680. The software kind of knew what we were doing. It already knew gene symbol, but if you look at this a select identifier type, you can put in all of these identifiers in here. And you'll notice that some of these databases, these aren't gene databases, this is proteins. You actually have, uh, uh, this thing will survey uh, metabolites. This works on a lot of stuff, microRNAs. Okay, just hit okay. All right, the next column is our log two fold change. This is how different those genes are in the aggressive versus non-aggressive lymphomas. So let's hit observation one. Okay, and it already knew it was a log ratio, but we can change it to anything we want. Full change, false discovery rate, whatever we want. Okay, two columns over, you'll see adjusted diff P value. Everybody see that? Make that observation one as well. Our log ratio and our p-value are tied observations. They're the same observation, so they are observation one. And again, this, this says p-value, it figured it out. Okay, let's hit save and create analysis. Okay, let's choose a new pro project. I'm gonna hit, let's go make this AACR5. And you'll notice in this window, you can put all kinds of notes. You know, what are the samples? What was my comparison? You know, anything you want. 
And trust me, you know, if you analyze enough data sets like me, this is a very important page. Because, you know, in any given week, I could be looking at four different diseases. So I'm like, what, where am I at? Who? I love it when collaborators, you know, I worked with them like three months later or three months ago and they call me, hey, remember that one sample that you were looking at? And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but I can go back and I can find out the details on this. Okay. New project. All right, you can just leave the name just as it is and let's hit save. This first step, basically, we're telling IPA what our gene list is. Where's our identifiers? What are our key values in that? In this case, full change significant values. Now this page, we, we're gonna tell Ingenuity how we wanna analyze it. We can use any data set we want. If for some reason we don't like the Ingenuity knowledge base, their data set, we can look at all kinds of other stuff. We can also, and I wanna point this out, there's all kinds of settings you have here. This tissue and cell lines, click on that. And on this given page, I can tell the software, hey listen, I know I put in these 748 genes, but I only wanna look at the genes that are known to be expressed in a specific cell type. Why would I possibly wanna do that? You may know. What do you think of, what about tumors? Right, a lot of us work on tumor tissue. What's in tumor tissue? Besides cancer, <laughs> right? You have blood cells, you got PBMCs, you can have stromal cells. You get it's a mess, right? This will help you kind of filter out that mess. That the cleaner your system is, so the genes we're going to look at today are from a cell line. That's a very clean system. The results we're going to get are very, very good. A lot of these things, you know, you can imagine all these different tissue types kind of, you know, you kind of bleed all the gene expression together. And so what this can allow you to do is maybe focus on, say, a specific immune cell, right? If you're working on THC1 cells or TH1 cells, this might be a good way to just find those genes. And you can make your own list. Say, hey, I got all these. You can look up, you know, what genes are exclusive and then just put that list in here. We can also mess with the log ratio. We can only look at upregulated, downregulated, and we can make our p-values more stringent if we want to. Okay, hit run analysis. Are you selecting all from there? Yes, select all, please. Okay, so project, just hit okay. All right, so this is going to run in the back one. We'll, we're going to come back to this. So basically what we've done is send our gene list to some supercomputer in Silicon Valley. And basically Ingenuity is taking their database and, and using your, tying all that information to your gene list. And basically they will find the results to all these connections and then send them back to you. So that's why it takes a little time. All right, let's go to David. So open up your browsers. Well, actually, yeah, go ahead and open up David. And before we do this analysis, what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to explain bioinformatics in one slide. I'm going to do it too. <laughs> All right, hold on. I see a lot of looks like, no, you're not. Oh, I totally am. And I would put this on um, the, the main like screen. But if I do that, then my movie cuts out. So actually, did I run my movie? No, I think it's off. Don't Bart. <laughs> okay. So maybe we can run our movie. Let's see. No, nope, yeah, it's off. Dang it. Oh, the movie was running. Dang it. That's all right. I can splice it together. Given here is a pathway that I know is important in lung cancer. And I want to see if this pathway is playing a role in the genes that we know are different in B, uh, the aggressive form of B-cell lymphoma, right? There's 40 members of this pathway. I have a gene list of 748 genes. What makes bioinformatics work is that we have a limited number of genes to pick from. That these 40 members of this pathway are, are part of this 25,000 human genes, right? 
Here's how bioinformatics works. I have a list of 748 genes. If I draw 748 times from all of these genes randomly, what are the odds that I get one of these? What do you think? Not very rare, right? You know, you can see that happening. But now what happens if out of 748 draws, I get three of them? Now that's a little more rare. I'd be more inclined to say that this pathway is somehow playing a role in my system. Now what if I get seven? The odds of that happening by random chance are incredibly low. Given this result, I would say that this pathway is probably playing a role in aggressive lymphoma. Does everybody see that? You can do this for any contained biological unit, right? I, I can do it for any pathway. I can do it for genes associated with a particular cellular function, like say, segregate, segregation of chromosomes. I can also do it to things known like targets of drugs. We know a lot about these genes. We know it's targets. We can use those as biological units to find out if it's there. This is simple statistics. This is exactly what we're doing with this bioinformatics. Does everybody get that? You now know more than about 90% of the researchers about bioinformatics. This is as simple as it gets, and that's really what we're doing with all this pathway analysis. All right, we'll close out of there. Okay, so let's go to, so here's what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up our gene list. So go back to your uh, folder on your desktop. What I want you to do is find an Excel spreadsheet that says RNA-seq ABC versus GBC FDR05. Everybody see that? Okay, let's open that up. Here are our genes on the first column. What I want you to do is put a, select BCL2A1. That's our top, our most significant gene. What does BCL2A stand for? Anybody? What are we working on? Science. <laughs> yeah. This makes sense. We're working on B cell lymphoma. Our, our top gene is B, B cell lymphoma, like, you know, B cell lymphoma 2A1. This makes sense. We're not just looking at random genes. You know, this, is, this is, makes biological sense. So here's what we're going to do is we're going to put it on this top one, and we're going to go all the way down to row 748, I believe, 749. Yeah, that, oh, I, yeah. So you just hit shift and we're gonna select all those. Just the genes, gene symbols. Okay, hit copy, however you wanna copy it. Now let's go back to our browser. This first window on David, you should be on the upload tab. Are on that upload tab? Let's paste that list in here. So control V or whatever you do. Oh, so this is one screen in from the main page. This is start analysis. Right. And again, the internet cop's probably going to kick some of you off at some point, so no worries. I think we made it all the way to functional annotation tab before people got kicked off. I'm going to try to uh, do the road. Yeah, that might, that might work. Okay. So has everybody got your gene list pasted in? It seemed to help yesterday. The first class, everybody crashed this thing. Yeah, maybe we should like sacrifice a small animal or something. Maybe that'll help. A little voodoo. A young PI, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> All right, so we've got enter our gene list. Let's go down to, we gotta select the identifier. This is what you should know about all this bioinformatics software. It's not magic. It needs to know what you're putting in. So on the select identifier, we have entered gene symbols. Official. Official gene symbols, not those fake kind. Damn fake kinds. Actually, that's what happens a lot. Like people, hey, can you check out this gene for me? And they'll give me like what they know of the gene and it'll be a whole list of that. And like it doesn't work for like can you please give me the NCBI designation please because then you have to look them up it's a pain 
What information did we not put in here? We got gene symbols, right? What other important information is with this uh, study? What do we leave out? What's half full change, right? And p-values. That is one thing about David is it does not take full change. IPA will. And in my book, if a gene goes up and down on a, in a particular condition, that's important. This software is just basically looking for text searching your genes and ignoring all the full chain stuff. Okay, go down to step three. This is our gene list. We're going to click this gene list here. If we were using that, so we're able to survey all genes, so we don't have to give it a background. It already knows the background. We're going to tell it what species it is, so it'll know what genes we had to choose from. But some, you know, like some of those protein arrays, like Somalogic, I don't know what are some of the other ones. Reverse phase. Reverse phase, blah, blah, blah. You know, you're not able to look at all proteins. So you have to basically, if, if you were going to analyze your gene list using that, uh, uh, a list from those technologies, you would have to tell it, hey, I only had these proteins to choose from, and this is my gene list, right? It goes back to that slide that I was talking about. Okay, let's oh. hit... Wait, oh, <laughs> let me submit my list first so I don't crash out. Okay. So everybody else, row one. <laughs> you look like a flight attendant. <laughs> row two. And if you, you'll get this, just say okay. We're going to tell it what background it is. Four. <sighs> Not the rest of the Caveman bioinformatics, love it. Okay, so go into your gene list manager. What you're gonna see is you're gonna try to select your species. And I think what these computers do is they put it way, you're gonna have to go all the way to the top. It makes the best guess that it's human, it's the top of that. The food chain. Yes, to go to the top of the food chain. Yeah. If you hit that arrow and just hold it down, it'll go pretty quick. Like I said, you get what you pay for, people. Okay, everybody do that? Okay, we're going to hit select species. We are working with human. So basically what David is doing now is now that it knows what species in, in our gene list, you know, what's in our gene list, it's basically text searching all those terms that are associated with our genes to find group things in, that are common. I want to point out some, uh, some of the tools with David. So let's go. The first one is this gene ID conversion tool. It's uh, the one third arrow down. Now, I do like this about David. It's is a very easy way to take, you know, say one identifier and turn it into another. That we have gene symbols, but say, hey, I'm more interested in proteins. I can get maybe the, uh, the protein IDs for these particular genes, these accession numbers. I use this a lot for like Affymetrix data. You can take Affymetrix probe set IDs. Have anybody, anybody work with Affymetrix? They're like two, four, eight, nine, seven, nine, underscore, X, underscore. You're going to see a lot of platforms like that. Illumina is even worse, right? Yeah. I like to look at the genes themselves. I like to see the gene names. And I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but a lot of these genes become kind of your, your friends, <laughs> you know, if you look at them long enough. That when I see NF Kappa B, I'm like, oh, man, somebody's pissed off. Or, you know, TNF, I'm like, ooh, that, that's going down. You know, that, that's kind of what you want is, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that, you know, these genes aren't just static things. They have character and they have buddies. And if you understand this, you're going to understand your system so much more. We spent so many years just, you know, that was your career is you just picked a gene and that's, you know, you study it for 30 years. We can't do that anymore, right? We have all this information. We have the tools to actually look at how do these genes interact together. We almost have to see this as an organic whole rather than just little bits. And, and trust me, you can do it. All right, so let's go back to, anytime you want to get back to your homepage, you hit go to start analysis. 
But not all at once. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, you're going to get kicked off at some point. Remember, I have YouTube videos. You can watch it. You can rewind it. Okay, let's go to gene name batch viewer. This is kind of where you get to the character of these genes, right? Given here, so we put in 748. Only 660 of them have information that David could use. So we've kind of whittled our gene list down a little bit, which is okay. That happens all the time. So you look at this top gene here, alpha-2 macroglobin-like 1. Well, it's not a top gene. It's just alphabetically ordered. But we can click on this. Click on this, this gene name here. This will give you information. Where is this gene? Ensemble ID, entry, entries gene name ID. What it will also do is give you references to its function. So you can click on any of these references and find information on the function of this particular gene. That can be useful. And again, you can download any of these files. Let's go back, close out this window. Now this is a very uh, useful function. This is actually, I like this about David, is what you can do is you could say, okay, is there any other, I know maybe say this gene is very important in my system. Are there any other similar or related genes like this in my gene list? So hit this RG. So what it has found, this is a Kappa score. It's basically using all these similar text terms to, to determine whether, you know, like protein functional domains and, you know, uh, other information. Basically, the higher the score, the more similar this gene is. So we've actually found a gene, CD109, that's very similar to this one. If I know that this one's important in our system, I would probably look at this one also as well. And you wouldn't be able to find that just, you know, basically just looking at the gene names. Okay, let's close out of this window. Okay, go back to start analysis. Should be back on this page. Next, we're going to hit the gene functional classification tool. So basically what this does, go ahead and click on that. What this does is it'll cluster genes based on similar go terms, gene ontology terms, right? And I'll, I'll show you more about that. So right now it's created 25 clusters. It's grouped a bunch of our genes on our gene list based on similarities on all kinds of, you know, protein domains, uh, path, similar pathways, um, et cetera. Um, I like to do this stringently. So let's do this. You can do this classification stringency. Let's go to high. Then we're going to hit rerun using options. Now we have 17 clusters. So basically what the software has done is it grouped these genes. It says these genes are very similar. That's why I've grouped them together based on the terms that are associated with each. And you can look here. Look at how many HLA genes are there. You know, you can just look at the gene names and go, yeah, there's, there's something similar here. There's a lot of proto cohering genes. If you want to figure out what those terms are that are uniting all this cluster, you hit on the, click on this T. These are all the biological terms or functions that are overrepresented in this particular cluster. That in this cluster, we have 64 genes that were, were put together, 58 of them, or actually 90% of them, are extracellular. I can click on this bar and find out all those genes. So this doesn't necessarily mean they're in the same pathway. It could just be that they have similar characteristics. Absolutely, yes. They're just grouping them based on lots and lots of different priorities. And there is a way we can actually get to the, the pathways. But this is important, right? Say I want to develop a target for this particular aggressive lymphoma. What genes am I more going to be interested in? Extracellular, right? It's a lot easier to target something on the outside of the cell than inside. You can also look at these genes and you might be able to find a, you know, be able to potentially isolate these through facts, right? If I find something on the outside of these aggressive lymphomas, I can develop an antibody to it and pull it out. 
There's a lot of information on here. Or say I have a kick butt glycoprotein you know, inhibitor. I can look in these, so there's 59 glycoproteins in this cluster. Maybe I look through there to find something I can block. Lots of information here. It's not just genes. And what I, I warn you to not do, which a lot of my collaborators do, is they'll do something like this where they can see the whole genome and they'll just go, what does my gene do? Or what do my favorite genes do in your gene list? And you're not using all the information. These kind of things, that, that all these things have a history, they have a biology behind them. And if you understand the story, you'll understand which characters you might need to take out, okay? Basically, everybody does is, you know, they just look at the first page of the book and go, yeah, there's the first character, but, you know, he might not die in the second chapter, you know? This allows you to kind of see what's going on and you can develop, you know, very meaningful experience, experiments based on the information. Okay, let's go back to, oh, did I just, no, no, I didn't. So close out that window. Okay, go back to start analysis. And then this is about the time where everybody nose dives. Okay, so yeah, let's do this on like, so I'm gonna hit functional annotation tool. Don't hit it yet. Okay, we're gonna trick the cop, hopefully. Okay, now you guys do it. One, <laughs> two. Did it crash? Three. We figured out, last day, we figured out how to do this. <laughs> it always works out. Well, the trick is to remember what to do next time. Yeah. Okay, everybody on this page? So now what we've done, previously what we did was we kind of grouped genes based on similar functional categories. Now we're picking out functional categories that have more than you would expect genes associated with them. This is an important page, and I kind of like this page with David. Let's go down to functional categories. That'll be the second one. Hit the plus here. These are like the pathways, or actually there's gene ontology here too. Basically, these are the functional categories that, that are overrepresented in our gene list. These are the databases David is text mining to, in order to find these genes. Anything in the red that's, that's checked, that's what it used for this particular sort. Let's go to the last one, up, seek, feature. Hit the chart here. These are the pathways or these functions that are overrepresented in our gene list. That given our 660 David IDs, I find 232 that are glycosylation site and linked. The odds of getting that by random chance, all those glycosylation type genes by random chance is 1.7 times 10 to the negative 16th, okay? Something's going on with glycosylation. <laughs> you know, extracellular, there's a lot of extracellular stuff in here. Why? Look at all these coherent domains. And again, you can click on any of these bars and see these. Oop, clicked on the wrong one. Oh, shoot. Okay, hold on. I'm going back. You know, look at all these coherent molecules. People don't know this. I've, I've been uh, mining a TCGA. Protocoherins are probably the most important mutated genes in lung cancer. And no one's really working on them. I don't know why. Look at that. Look at all these protocoherin genes. Cell adhesion plays a huge role as can cancers advance. I see cell adhesion molecules in just about any kind of cancer I look, work on, especially the epithelial. Okay, let's go. I want to show you one more thing here. This is really cool. Actually, this is the thing about David I really like. Go down to protein interactions and click on that. Do you see this last category, UCSF? TFBS. What do you think TFBS stands for? What's that? Transcription factor binding site. Yes, you were correct. <laughs> Just yell it out. We don't care. We got Zoo here. He's always wrong. Huh? <laughs> what? Okay, so we're going to hit this chart. Basically, what this does is it took our gene list and it said, are there any 
transcription factor binding sites overrepresented the genes that we just imported. Hit this chart here. This is a really cool page. Anybody crash and burn yet? <coughs> awesome. If we look here, in our 660 genes that we imported that are associated with aggressive lymphomas, 340 of them have a binding site for MFAT. Anybody uh, know what MFAT does? Anybody work on any immunological people here? NFAT's a hardcore immunological transcription factor. I find with a lot of these cancers, there's a huge immunological uh, component to them. That if you think about it, all of us probably get cancer at some point. We've probably had it lots and lots of times. It's that our immune system takes care of it be before it becomes a problem. What I'm finding is that these cancers have to hide somehow. You saw those HLA genes, we're gonna see that more in, uh, in the uh, uh, ingenuity stuff. But NFAT, this is probably how this tumor, this aggressive tumor is hiding, is these NFAT genes. Maybe they're being suppressed, we don't know yet. But where's STAT3? It's way down in this list, right? There it is, STAT. 277 potential binding sites. If I was running this show, I would probably put more emphasis on NFAT than it would STAT3, but it's not my paper. So you basically do it based on the p-value, the, just the number, the, the count itself, right? Yeah. So like OCT1, I got like 554 of those, right? Like, yeah, but that's a thing. Yeah. Do you even, like, how do you well, here, so look at the count. So we'll, we'll, we'll sort this by count. That's a very good question, right? <laughs> OCT1 is binding the most stuff in our gene list, right? But look at the p-value. You know, there's so many potential OCT1 sites that the p-value is actually much less than the NFAT because there's, you know, the potential genes that, that might have it is larger. So it's not as significant. So you can actually sort this any way you want. So in this instance, I would say OCT1 might not be as important as some of these more significant p-values. Which are... Yeah, like, what's the absolute t-value? Because I would think like 4 times 10 to negative 10 is actually really impressive, right? But it is. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you also have choices in talent and minus 4. You know, these p-values are kind of, you know, it's... Especially for this analysis, is that they, they can be kind of relative. And what you should look at it, you know, per experiment, you should kind of see that as more of a kind of a ranking thing, system. You know, I, I've seen p-values that, you know, 0 0.05 that are, you know, spectacular. You know, I get results and they validate it. And I've seen something that are really, really small and we can't validate it. But usually when I rank my p-values and I rank my targets based on the p-values, usually that's pretty good. What's uh, Benjamini? Benjamini Hoffmeyer. The two old men. <laughs> uh, David has built in a few choose the option button, there's maybe four different methods that you can get false discovery calculations. Uh, these are the two defaults. So it's just the standard p-value and one of the correct. Right. So what you're doing is you're running so many statistical tests on these uh, um, transcription factor binding sites that, you know, you've got a lot of tests, so they're trying to correct for the multiple testing there. I don't think the Benjamini Hoffmeyer really works too well, you know, when you're looking at some stuff like this. So I don't pay too much attention to it. I just mainly look at the smaller is better there. Yeah. yeah, totally. Absolutely. And in every case, the corrected value will be lower than All right. But one last point from the list is again, you, in a person, you need to discriminate the tumor from all the other normal And you have to know what factor you could actually chemically. So you can take those criteria and develop a new hypothesis from that list. So it was a stat three list, but actually stat five B is higher up. Yeah, you saw Maybe that. Stat five B would have been a better target in this particular cancer. Absolutely. What is the count number referred to here? So that would be the number of genes out of the, what we put in that um, have that binding site. So our total list is six hundred sixty. 
All right, let's go to IPA. If I can find it. There we go. Come on. There it is. All right, the gene list that we imported should be in bold. Does everybody see that? Okay, double click on, you can get rid of that core analysis stuff. Double click on that. What will first come up is a summary page, and it will basically show you kind of the highlights of your gene list that we just put in. So here are some of the top canonical pathways. Our top one is T helper cell differentiation. We're looking at B cell lymphoma. This might be important. Maybe this is how this thing is hiding. Look at the upstream regulators. This is a really cool. This is actually my favorite tab almost on the IPA. What's our top upstream regulator? What is it? B cell receptor. Science. <laughs> yeah, you know, it makes sense. And I will tell you that we don't measure it directly, but I know it's operating in our system based on the fact that it leaves so many waves in the transcriptome. That's what I really want to stress to you is that we can find things that aren't even there. If it affects gene expression, I will see it. And this goes for drugs. Uh, one of the stories I like to tell, I was analyzing this, it was a clinical trial and you had your you know, experimental group and they couldn't have any drugs besides what they were given. But then it was compared to this control group of LGBT people that could, you know, they could be on any, a lot of different kinds of drugs. When I did the comparison, like the biggest difference that came up was that the control group had this huge Viagra signal compared to the control. I kid you not. I've done, you know, looking at you know, like young people, you know, I'll see cannabinoid, you know, uh, um, waves in the transcriptome. I can find microRNAs, cytokines, and that's important, right? It's not just your tumor and what's in the tumor that's important in the cancer. You've got all these hormones and stuff actually interacting with it. And you never see it because you don't survey that tissue. With this software, we can find those effects based on the waves it leaves in the tumor transcriptome. Okay. All right. So we're at summary page here. Let's see. Um, let's go to diseases and function. That's my first page I always like to go to. Okay, scrunch your window up. I know everybody's like, mine doesn't look like that. If you scrunch it up, it will, trust me. Anything with a box represents genes associated with particular disease or biological function that's overrepresented in our gene list. I like to size these by the number of genes. So if you go to the top bar, yeah, it's, it's your, your tab in the middle. Hit number of genes. The bigger the box, the more genes of our gene list it contains. If I look here, one of the biggest boxes is cancer. Out of the 660 genes that we put in, or the software recognizes, 258 of them are associated with cancer. You can see all these things. And not only that, but the software will make a call that click on, actually I saw a lympho. So click on the cancer one. What I can do is I can pull out all those genes associated with cancer. And what this will also do is, that's what's nice about with the full change information. Here's what the database does. It says, okay, we know this gene here is associated with cancer. Based on the literature, when the gene expression goes up, it's known to increase the process of cancer. Therefore, there's a one piece of evidence that says that this cancer is going up based on your gene list. If you want to get to those references, you can click here, this number six, that will give you all the references showing that an increase in this gene or protein causes an increase in cancer. And you can just see all the evidence here. Based on all this evidence in our gene list, this software will make a confidence score. They call it a Z-score. So based on the pattern of expression of genes that are associated with this particular function, there is 3.2 times 
you know, standard deviations above random noise that suggest that the cancer is increased. This software considers anything above two standard deviations above uh, um, uh, random noise to be significant. So anything with an orange, you can close out of that window. Let me open this a little bit. So what you can do is, let's get to the top. You can hit this arrow here. Keep hitting it. Ugh. I think that's top. Yep. Anything with an orange, this software thinks is going to be increased based on the pattern of expression. Anything blue is expected to be inhibited. You know, just mouse over some of these. Abdominal neoplasia. You know, hematological neoplasia. Differentiation of lymphocytes. There's one here, quantity of lymphocytes. This makes sense. These are all going up. These are biological processes we expect to be more increased in aggressive forms of cancer. And remember, we are not comparing normal versus cancer. This is the same cancer, just two different variations of it. And we see all of this. What's the only thing going down? <laughs> Science. <laughs> Dang straight. If you were really interested in apoptosis, you could click on any of these things and take a closer look at those genes. I guarantee you BCL2 like one is in the middle of all this stuff. Okay, let's go to canonical pathways. That's everybody's favorite thing, right? So that would be your second tab. Hit the horizontal view. I like to look at that way better. I like to read them. Here are our pathways that are overrepresented in our gene list. I want to point something out before we start taking a look at this, though, is that go to the second tab, overlapping. Well, actually, you can go down here. You can see all the things. Ooh, look at that. Stat 3 pathways on here. Sure enough, it's playing a role. Here is the thing about these pathways is that they share lots and lots of members. So if I go to my overlapping tab, and I zoom in here, I can hit the show the number of common genes. So if a pathway shares common genes, it'll have a line to it. Right? Look at this. IL-4 signaling in allelograph rejection shares seven members. How do I know which pathway to take? Remember, these are idealized pathways, and they might not necessarily be the exact things going on in your system. And they're very simple as well. I like pathways to kind of give me an idea of what's going on. And you can see this stat pathway, and I think this, this diagram gives us a really good thing. You know, it kind of shows us how, where it's making its connections. When you do the uh, show peak values, is there a way you can like, filter it by the peak values? Mm -hmm. So here it is. You have lots of, of filters that you can use. Are you talking in the overlapping one? or? Right. Yeah, so you can actually go see this oil can thing here. Right. Filter. Oh, actually, you can't filter by p values. You can do like the most significant ones. So here we could say, okay, I only want to see the top 15 pathways, and I want the number of minimum com common molecules to, for you to draw a line between the pathways to be two. Then you can hit apply. You can see that cleans that up a little bit. Not only that, but look at this. You can see kind of jacks going into stat, going into, you know, this kind of uh, growth factor thing. But again, all of these things here, these pathways, be careful about just picking one of these because they're all kind of the same and they're all immunological. That's the information I get out of this stuff. Is there a way to display this so it's like cleaner, like they're more spaced apart so you can... Oh, yeah. So this is Java. So you can do whatever you want. You can pull these out. Now you know why the high school kids like this. This is a video game for them. <laughs> you know, we all have this inherent ability to recognize patterns. And that's exactly what the software allows you to do. I am a visual person. I like to see the data. Me looking at a bunch of genes in tabular form doesn't do anything for me. I like stuff like this. That our minds are able, you know, vis the visual scheme is just kind of a natural way for us to visualize complex data. We do it all the time. That your, your average high-definition TV has like 2 million pixels in it, right? 
When you watch TV, do you see all two million boxes? Heck no. Your brain, if you do, you should go see a doctor. Is there a doctor in the house? No, I mean, you've got two million, you know, your brain puts that together. If you see it visually, your brain can put that information together and make sense of it. So I like visual stuff. Are you allowed to take this picture and publish it? Yes, you can absolutely do that. And in fact, they encourage that for sure. As you can see, let's go to these charts here. Let's go to stat three pathway. Click on that bar. If we look down below, and I'm going to drag this up so you can see, these are all the genes in our gene list associated with STAT3 signaling. Here's its fold change, or log fold change. Here's its p-values. It, this is kind of nice. It'll also let you know if it's been a biomarker in any other studies. And sure enough, a lot of these have. That's usually a red line, a red light for me. It's like, Oh, it's been a biomarker in some. I bet this is important. I hope you're seeing through this is that there's not one answer, that you can't, that bioinformatics is not a meat grinder. You don't take your gene list and put it on the top and then it goes bloop, 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 and then gives you an answer. Here's the cancer gene. That's not how it works. You have to. You are the investigator. You know your system. Use the computer to find the answer. One of the stories I like to tell, and I tell this a lot, is that it's true that, you know, Big Blue, you know, the supercomputer from IBM, can beat the world's greatest chess player, right? What they don't tell you is that that chess player can then get a computer and beat Big Blue, right? There is something about the human mind and the computer put together that makes both better. And that's what I'm trying to get you to see with this software, is you've got to be on top of these algorithms. It's you that makes the choice. If you're letting the computer make the choice, why do I need you? You are the experts in this system. This should be, you know, this should be something that you're definitely involved in. So let's click on stat three. Okay, let's open the pathway. So if you click on the bar, you can hit this open pathway. Anything that's colored was on your gene list. These are all the members of this pathway. This is our gang that we're looking at. If you watch my YouTube videos, you'll understand why that reference. <laughs> Anything colored, red, went up in the aggressive lymphomas. Anything green, which is not shown here, at least in this pathway, which makes sense, would be going down. Based on the pattern of expression, what do you think STAT3 signaling is doing? Going up, right? We've got increased signal from the outside. We've got a growth factor here. We've got some molecules here, STAT3, BCL2, PIM1. This is probably all this anti-apoptosis prop, what, what we're seeing in the expression data. BCL2 like one. These are all the rock stars of cancer over here. And we just found them in this pathway. And you can publish this stuff. I can download any of this stuff, save a graphic file. I can modulate it any way I want. Let me show you what you can do with this. Say I'm interested in my gene. Um, you know, say I want to know if PC or uh, P53 has any connections here. Go to build. Click on the build. And we're going to select add a molecule relationship. Everybody with me? Build ad molecule relationship. You'll see this thing. We can pick anything we want because what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the software what this little circle is going to be. So click on biological drug, highlight it, and then just click somewhere in the white over here. Everybody do that? Okay. Now let's double click on that circle. You'll see this page come up. Here's where we tell it what that little circle is we created. I want this to be P53, so TP53. That's the official gene symbol. Hit search. There we go. Okay. There's a lot of things with TP53 in it. What we want to do is find our specific gene. So go up about, it's, I don't know, two-thirds of the way up. You'll see TP53. 
I'm going to hit select. By the way, I can do this with like drugs too. Like I could put in a drug and say, are there any targets of this drug in my pathway? Some of the MDs woke up now. <laughs> Anytime I say drug, everybody's like, you know, the MDs are like, yeah, we can put some drugs in there. <laughs> everybody wants to work with a drug company. Okay, so I've got TP53 here. Now what I'm going to do is I want to try to connect it to anything in this, this pathway that, I've, that, that we're looking at. So what we're going to do is in the same menu, we're going to hit connect. Okay. So now I'm at this, this, I can do any kind of connections that I want. I can do direct and indirect. I'm just going to leave the defaults. But I could also say I want to show the connections to TP, P, TP53 to this pathway in just a specific cell type that I only want to see if there's only evidence of it saying being in lung or B lymphoma, that's what I want to see. We're going to leave all the defaults here. Now hit apply. <laughs> Science. Look at that. P53 is all over here. You can do that with any of your genes on your list. You can do this with a drug that you're interested in. I can overlay drug information here. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's find if there are any drugs that are, uh, have potential members in this pathway. So under overlay, so you're doing overlay, select drug. Ooh, look at that. So in this instance, I'm not even going to try to pronounce these silly drugs. I'm horrible with that. But you, there are three molecules or three genes in our pathway that are inhibited by these drugs. Maybe I use a combination. It'll tell you exactly what those drugs are. I can find out if there's overrepresented biological functions in this. This is what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, Again, this isn't static information. You know, there's a kinetics to all of this stuff. And if you figure it out, you can go a long ways. You will, you will know more than your boss by far. When you're doing this kind of process, looking for targets, uh, what do you call it, like in silico analysis? Or what, what do you title it? Like if you're writing a paper, or like we will find these genes using, or you just say we're going to use ingenuity pathway analysis? Um, I would say we would use upstream regulators. We would determine whether there are overrepresentative targets of, say, something. Okay. But yeah. there's no, like, generic header? Like, you know how we have in vivo, in vitro, you know? No, not really. Okay. Yeah. Going fishing. <laughs> <laughs> Except I know I have good fishing holes. That's exactly what this... Oh, dang it. There goes my video, too. Oh, maybe not. Come on. Yeah. All right. All right, let's go to um, networks. So that'll be one, two, three, four tabs over. Now, here's what the software does, is it basically groups these based on any type of biological relationship in the scientific literature. They don't have to be in the same pathways. They don't have to be, you know, same functional groups. It, basically what the software does is say, is there any evidence that there's a relationship between these genes anywhere? And I would say these are probably the more realistic signaling things that are going on in this B-cell lymphoma. So click on number one. You can see all of these genes. So if it, it's green, it's going down. If it's red, it's going up. You can see all these things associated with amyloid beta precursor protein, which is also going up. The odds of getting all of these genes associated with this thing by random chance is 10 times, or 1 times 10 to the negative 51st. You basically take the scores of these networks and basically use that as the, uh, you put the negative and just use it as a, uh, the exponent for 10. 
and this is kind of where it gets back at is like, why would I, you know, if I'm looking for a great target or if I want to influence a system, why would I mess with any of these things when they're all connected to this? Maybe this is how I penetrate my system. Let's go to the second network. This is a cool one. And you can see we have overlapping networks. It'll show you like, you know, how many genes are in common. And I'm sorry, where did you find like the P value that you just described? Um, it's actually in the score. In the score. So you can basically take the score and make it a negative value in the exponent of 10. Let's go to the second one here. Look at all these things that are associated with ERK. So you'll notice that not all of these genes are on our gene list, but what the software does and what I like is it'll include certain things that connect the genes on your gene list because we can't measure everything, right? We can actually color it. We can tell the software, hey, which direction? You know, we have, so if there's a dashed line, that means it's an indirect relationship. If it's a solid line, that means there's evidence for a direct relationship. And you can click on any of these lines and find the reference that tells you that there's a relationship there. I think. There it is. Right? Here's a paper that shows that these two things are related. Now what we can do is we actually can color these lines based on what we know about how these genes interact. So in your middle one, let's go to overlay. The second choice down is going to be MAP, Molecular Activity Predictor. Click on that. So what this has done, based on the gene expression that we put in, the full change information, it'll tell you whether it expects it to be more active or inhibited. So hit start prediction. We're just going to leave everything the way it is. So anything with an orange line, this thing is known to induce. We can look here. This SCN2A is known to induce this. It's going up as well. Again, this kind of gives us kinetics for our list. It's no longer static. There's directionality to it now, and that's important. Again, irk in the middle here. If there's a blue line, that means it's going down. And again, now that I made this network, now I can look to see maybe there's some pathways that might be interested with this network. So I can go to overlay, and I can go to canonical pathways. All right. There are five genes in this network that are associated with xeno, xenobiotic metabolism. And again, you can give them here, they'll give them here. I can actually include that, do this label, do it on. And actually, if you go over to the network, you'll see it connected. Here are all the genes associated with xeno xenobiotic metabolism. They're highlighted in blue. Again, I can find drugs. This is, you know, like I said, no gene works by itself. And when you find clusters like this with known biological interactions, it makes these genes more likely to be affected in your system. Does that make sense? It's like gathering all these pieces of information, right? I might have the, you know, the murder weapon, now I got the body. <laughs> Everybody's scared now. <laughs> I hope you're not going to the dinner tonight. <laughs> so that's basically what we're doing is we're gathering pieces of evidence. I've got all these genes in order to associate with itself. They're all associated with a biological process. You know, it makes it more likely that it's going to be part of our, our process. So let's go to upstream analysis. I'm going to show you something here. This is where we get to our big guns in any gene list. This is probably my favorite page, is that even though I don't measure directly BCR, it interacts with 29 genes on my gene list. The odds of getting that by random chance are 2.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. 
Not only that, but based on the pattern of its target genes, I know it's probably more active in my system. That's big time information to know if you're actually, you know, trying to analyze your gene list. You can also sort this by any way, ways. Let's find out how many, which molecule has the most targets in our gene list. So click on this target molecules and data set. Click on that. Which gene has the most targets in our data set? Is everybody still with me? <laughs> yeah, TGF beta 1. If you know anything about cancer, TGF beta 1 is always higher in anything aggressive, big time. Beta estradiol, estrogen, probably more active. Where's STAT 3? Is it down here? Yeah, it is. Here's STAT 3. It interacts with 39 genes in our gene list. The odds of getting that by random chance are 4.5 times 10 to the negative 19th. Not only that, but we're seeing it go up and sure enough, the software says, yeah, STAT3 is going up in your system. We can actually, let's take a look at that. So highlight STAT3, put display as a network. That means that most of the genes are in our gene list are going up versus going down. So it says there's kind of a bias there. So here is STAT3. Here's our culprit right in the middle. It interacts with all of these other genes are on your gene list. If there's an orange line, that means STAT3 is known to induce. And sure enough, these are red. That means they're going up with the aggressive. If it's blue, STAT3 is known to inhibit that particular molecule. And RP2 is going down. It agrees with a more active state of STAT3. The only genes that are not following that pattern are in the, with the yellow lines. Based on the overwhelming evidence of STAT3 being more active, the software will say, yes, STAT3 is active. Not only is it in your system, but it's actually probably more active. How do you make the, the other conditions connect to each other? Yeah, watch this. So we get back off a little bit. So what you can do is you can select this whole thing so given that all these genes are connected to STAT, they're probably connected to each other, right? So I select you basically draw a box around your whole thing. You got to zoom out a little bit. Then I'm going to go to build. I'm going to hit connect. And then I'm going to hit apply. Just leave all the defaults. I think you're going to see a mess. I love this. Look at that. Look at that spider web. That's how biology works. It is spider webs. You know, everything depends on everything else. And it's not hopeless. And if you expect to, like, put your gene list in and get, like, you know, you're not going to do this in an hour. This takes time. Um, let me show you one more thing. So let's go to STAT3. Here's the really powerful part of this software program is it now will take these upstream regulators and make networks out of them. So let's find out the upstream network of STAT3. So go all the way over and you'll hit this, this column here, mechanistic networks, it's your last column. It'll have 185 and then it'll have 18 in parentheses. Click on that. These, so not all, you know, in that last paper, the paper that was published, let me see, come on. In that paper that was published, it basically said STAT3 is going up. Now what I'm like, now we have information to say STAT3 is going up and it's probably, you know, doing its function through these master regulators, interferon gamma, interferon alpha. Look down here, NFAC kappa B is going up, STAT 5B, STAT 1. You know, these are the rock stars of cancer. This is the skeleton that uh, basically puts together your gene expression data. We can actually go to STAT 3. I'm going to show you one more thing. So select STAT 3. 
you know, we're, we're interested in STAT3, but I want to know, is there anything upstream of STAT3 that might, we might be able to target to get to it, right? So click on STAT3, we're going to go to build. Okay, I want you to hit the, the first option you have is grow. So click grow. Okay, I want to find, so here in the general settings, I'm gonna find interactions that are direct, but I'm, I'm gonna get all molecules that I can, so click on that. But I only wanna see things that are upstream of the selected molecule, so upstream of STAT3. Click on that. Now what I want, I want to only find those genes that are upstream of STAT3 that also changed on my gene list. So click this second option here. And it'll show you the list that it's using, ABC versus GCB. I can use any list I want. That's a really cool part of this, is that I can take gene lists that I found other places and then overlay it on this. Let's hit apply. I hope something shows up. Here is everything upstream of STAT that we could possibly target to affect its activity. And these also all, all change on our gene list. Again, that's kind of what I get, want to get across is that, you know, you can go big to small, you can go upstream to downstream. You just don't get one gene list. You can make it lots and lots of subsets, big lists, small lists. But again, it's this kind of software, both David and IPA, that allows you to do this, to allow you to see the data. Any questions? Everybody's like, that was way too much information. <laughs> Trust me, I got, I got YouTube videos. Like I said, you know, high schoolers do this. You guys can do this. This is not that hard. And most of your institutions will probably have, you know, you can use David, but most institutions you should be able to get a way to use IPA. Do you have any examples of uh, papers that have done this like very well in a way that, yeah, I'm just trying to like think of a way that you can tie this into like with the bench and then the, the clinic, you know, like something that kind of puts it all together really nicely. Well, of course my papers. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you know, honestly, this is a very, not a lot of people are using this. I think most people think like, it's a whole different way to think about gene lists and expression data. And I don't think oh, there's a lot of people comfortable with it. But there are some papers out there that are actually using this very well. What is this? On another note, the David homepage has a very detailed nature and methods. What I've seen is people with big lists of genes and they use GSTA to give you pathways. Like, yes. How does that relate to like, is it like parallel workflow? Like, it's just a, it's a different way to do that. And so what GSA does is it utilizes your entire gene list, um, which can be good and bad. You know, it depends how noisy your gene list is. I'm not a big fan of GSA personally. I think these, like I said, these pathways are only useful to a certain point. That, you know, you know, when you really want to get to the nuts and bolts of what's going on in your system, you have to start creating, you know, your pathways like this, you know. The thing that I try to do is I let the data lead me. That I'll throw this through here and then I don't have any preconceived notions of what I'm supposed to see. And that's very different than what most people, most scientists are doing now. You know, they focus in on this pathway and they say, you know, they'll come to me and say, okay, find out how the, your, the, all this data bolsters what we previously thought. And that's not how you should approach this data. You know, you're able to see anything. Let it lead you to the answer, and it will. Just give it time. And don't treat it like a, you know, some kind of, you know, automon or, a, you know, kind of factory process. It's all based on your information. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you.